Good morning. All right. So my name is Brian Cross. I am a principal solutions engineer at GitHub today. Want to thank everybody for joining us for this iteration of GitHub Demo Days, uh, where we're going to be looking at GitHub Actions in a little more depth. So we'll start off with a uh, little review for those of you that may not have been able to make previous sessions or haven't been exposed to uh, GitHub Actions yet. I'll also introduce my teammate, James Ha. He and I are tag teaming this because I am sitting in the parking lot of the Great Basin National Park Visitor Center in far eastern Nevada, basically the absolute middle of nowhere, where somehow I have excellent connectivity. And I give you guys a... Uh, scenic backdrop but the fires in california have cut visibility down to under a mile so can't really tell where i am all right so james you want to say good morning will do hey everyone it's really great to be here with you as brian said i'm his peer here at github uh, also a solutions engineer so i'll be moderating the chat so feel free to ask your questions and we want to have a really interactive experience with everyone all right so just let us know anything you're considering and i'll feed that information to brian yeah, absolutely. Let's make this interactive. I've done this demo 100 million times. So uh, the more uh, questions and specific uh, points of view that we can address, I think the better off uh, we'll all be. All right. So uh, thanks, James, for that introduction. And uh, can you see my screen? I can. Yes, sir. Awesome. All right. Let's go ahead and get started. So we're going to start off, like I said, with kind of a review, uh, something that I like to call the five minute demo that shows just how quickly you can get started doing real work. Uh, continuous integration and continuous delivery slash continuous deployment with GitHub Action. So what you're seeing right here is a brand new empty repository. Nothing in here, nothing up my sleeve, nothing under my hat. Uh, what we're going to do is set up actions to uh, package an application and deliver it to NPMJS and to the GitHub package registry uh, all in less than five minutes. And at the same time, GitHub Dependabot will let us know whether or not there are any vulnerabilities in our open source dependencies uh, and create pull requests if a patch exists. So real quick, we'll just jump over to some code that I have already written, but have not yet pushed. Uh, just a typical JavaScript application. I bumped my version here so that we'll successfully publish over to npmjs. And now I'm just going to go ahead and push this up to GitHub. And as soon as that's complete, uh, Dependabot will do its thing and we'll go over and look at uh, creating some GitHub actions. And of course, connectivity being what it is, this may or may not work. So we'll give it a second here to see if it can actually push its way through. There we go. And let's head back over here and see if we'll be lucky enough to be able to refresh this page. And if not, there it is. All right, so here we are. We're, what, 20, 30 seconds into this demo, and already I know that I have introduced vulnerabilities into uh, my enterprise here by virtue of something that I imported into, uh, uh, into my code. Uh, and it's worth pointing out, by the way, that 90% or more of the code that's going into new applications in the enterprise uh, is actually open source code that people are pulling in uh, through their uh, dependency file. So that works for Node, it works for Java, it works for Ruby, it works for Go. Any of these other uh, platforms that we uh, code on today, the vast majority of the actual code that we're using is written by somebody else, which of course is great because that's work we don't have to do, uh, but it's also potentially an avenue for vulnerabilities to uh, enter our uh, repositories, enter our code bases and cause problems later on. We'll touch back on that here in a sec. All right, so as I said, what I want to do is uh, create a GitHub action, a GitHub workflow to package and deliver this application to npmjs and also to the GitHub package registry. So what I'm going to do is click on the actions tab. That takes me over here. And what I'm going to see at this point are the workflows that are suggested for my repository. And it's worth looking uh, at all of these because GitHub is the home to over 50 million developers. And what that means is everybody and anybody who plays in this space, whether they provide a tool or a service, or particularly if they're a cloud provider, they wanna make it as easy as possible for you to take advantage of their products and or services. So there are tons of templates in here that our partners, AWS, Google Cloud Platform, Azure have created that make it very simple with one click and a little bit of modification to start delivering your code to, uh, uh, to their platforms. However, 
Uh, it's also possible for you uh, as an organization admin on GitHub to set up template workflows as well. And that's what I've done here. So I've set up a template workflow for Node CI CD just for my organization. And in a second, we'll uh, figure out why that is important and how it can help your teams to greatly increase their velocity. So I'm gonna click on set up this workflow and that's exactly what happened. So I've got a workflow file here. I'll zoom in a little bit on that just to make sure everybody can see. Uh, and here it is. So uh, just to review on how GitHub workflow files work, the first section is a trigger. Uh, and GitHub supports over 100 events uh, that you can use to trigger workflows. So we often think about triggering CI CD when we push code, uh, maybe when we create a pull request, uh, maybe when we do something else with respect to the source code. In this case, we are triggering when we create a GitHub release. Uh, and a GitHub release, of course, is just a package of binaries and other files linked to a specific commit uh, that uh, folks can download. But when that event happens, we're going to run this workflow. And what are we going to do in this workflow? Let me move this up a little bit here, see if we can get a little more view. Make this a little bigger. All right. So we're going to do two things. The first is we're going to build this code. <clears throat> so this is the build uh, step inside of this job. I'm sorry, this is the build job inside of this workflow. Workflows, of course, can have multiple jobs. So in this case, we're gonna just do a simple build on the latest version of Linux, Linux, Ubuntu uh, Linux, but it's worth pointing out that you can build your code on Linux, on Windows, on Mac, or any combination of those three at the same time. And we'll take a look at that in a second when we uh, talk about matrix builds. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna use an action to check out the code onto our runner. We're using runners that GitHub hosts in our cloud. Uh, and then we're going to set up the node environment on that runner to do what we need to do. And in this case, we're gonna use node version 12. So these are GitHub actions inside of a workflow. And if you look at these right here, those look suspiciously like parts of a URL or a URL slug, and that is exactly what they are. So if you go to github.com forward slash actions forward slash setup node, uh, you can actually browse the source code for uh, this action. So what actions are, are reusable components, just like the open source modules that we use to extend our uh, coding capabilities with our source code, we can now do exactly the same thing with GitHub Actions. So we're gonna go ahead and set up our runners and then we're gonna just run some simple NPM commands to do uh, uh, some testing uh, and then we're gonna move on. So the next uh, job in this workflow is publish to Node Package Manager. Now, interestingly, we don't wanna do this if our build fails for whatever reason. Uh, so we have this needs clause. If the build job succeeds, we will move on and run the next few jobs. If not, uh, the workflow will fail and we'll have to take some sort of action. So much the same sort of thing here. We're going to run CI again just for good measure. But here we're going to JS, which is the registry we're set up for right here. You know that you have to authenticate. And I'm using a secret. Uh, now, I've, this is a brand new repository. I haven't set up any secrets. These are secrets that are set at the organization level, which again means that as an organization admin, you can not only set up the template workflows like we're using right here, but you can store secrets like usernames and passwords for services like NPMJS. The folks in your organization that are using these workflow templates will never see those. They don't have to interact with them. They're just available for them. So that'll publish to NPM. And then at the same time, again, if the build job succeeds, we're gonna do exactly the same thing, uh, publishing to the GitHub Package Manager. And one of the cool things about the GitHub Package Manager is it's designed to work completely seamlessly with the CLI tools that you're already using for package management. So same NPM tool set, nothing changes. All we have to do is redirect it to the right URL for the GitHub Package Manager. Uh, and uh, in this case, apply the secret that's provided by this workflow. All right, so that's this simple workflow in a nutshell. It takes me longer to tell you about it than it does to create it. Let's go ahead and commit this. And bear in mind that workflows are just code files. So they live in the same repository and they are susceptible to the same uh, workflows uh, that you would use for anything else. So the code uh, and the workflows and the other objects that are working on uh, testing, building and delivering that code all live in the same repo. No need to switch over to other tools, no need to context switch. And most importantly, all of the teams, all the people that are responsible for these uh, are working together in the same place and are able to use GitHub to create a true collaborative home. So when we say dev and ops, this is what we mean. Let's put the developers and the ops folks in the same place working in the same way.
All right, so here is our workflow file. It lives in the .github directory. Uh, and as we discussed earlier, this is gonna trigger when I create a GitHub release. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. I am going to click on create a new release. Uh, and the way this works is you give it a git tag. We'll call this version 5.77. And then in the interest of time, I'm not gonna fill anything else out. And we'll go ahead and publish this release. So under the covers, that has fired that event that we talked about, which will trigger the action. Here's my release. Uh, and if I go over to the actions tab, I can see that in fact, my basic node CI job is running. So I can click on that and focus my view in a little more, click on the actual workflow and we'll see the jobs that are running. So right now the build job is running. As we discussed, the other two jobs that are actually gonna deploy this stuff uh, depend on this job completing successfully. Now, obviously these are running on runners. It's gonna take a little while for this to actually happen. So while that's going on, let's go and take a look at what Dependabot has done in the meantime. So earlier we talked about how uh, GitHub very quickly scanned uh, my dependencies in my package.json file. And in fact, as this big yellow banner that nobody could possibly de deny exists, uh, lets me know uh, uh, very unequivocally that there are vulnerabilities that I've injected into my enterprise. So let's learn more about them by clicking on the C Dependabot alerts. There they are, the usual suspects. If I click on one of these, for example, Lodash, which often comes up in these uh, situations, I can see that uh, I need to bump it to version 4.17.20. Uh, GitHub tells me what I need to do to do this in a couple of different ways, as well as information about why this is a problem, right? So I can make a decision myself uh, about whether I agree that this is a low severity bug. All right. More than that though, uh, in the time it takes really to learn what these alerts are all about, if I click on the pull request tab, GitHub has already created these pull requests. So here's the one to bump Lodash. If I click on that, I can see what commits were necessary in order to make this actually happen. Uh, I can see the changes that happened in the uh, package.json file. In other words, this is just a normal pull request. So we can run it through the same review process. The difference is GitHub created it for me uh, as a developer. And honestly, that's 90% of the battle uh, in terms of improving your team's uh, response time uh, around fixing their vulnerabilities. All right, let's go see what's happening over on the actions page. So it looks like the uh, build job has succeeded. Uh, we got the little green check mark. That's great. As a result, we have now moved on and we have completed the published job, both for NPM uh, and GPR. So over here on the right, I can see what's going on. So if I want to see what my CI results were, I can open that up in the log. Uh, I can see the actual output of those commands if I want to see that. Uh, and I can also see the results of the published command. So if anything had gone wrong, I can figure that out in here. All right, let's move it over to NPM real quick. We just published 5.77. You see the 10 days ago, I published 5.75. Let's do a quick refresh. See if that actually worked. And this would be the time. Oh, there we go. Connectivity is great. Uh, so actually, I published 5.78. Uh, that was what was in my package.json file. So that worked. Let's head back over to GitHub uh, and just validate that the packages actually uh, worked as well. So I'm gonna refresh this page, uh, scroll down to the packages section. And actually that may take a little bit for that to show up, but it is there, 5.78. So there you go. It took me longer to tell you about it than it did to actually do it. Uh, so getting started with GitHub Actions is very, very straightforward. Uh, again, some of the keynotes, actions, reusable components that now allow you to compose your workflow instead of actually write it. Uh, the ability to set up template workflows that are pre-configured uh, to work in your organization. So let's drill down a little bit into how we actually do that. So if I have an organization, uh, in this case, it's github.com forward slash rebelware, I can create a special repository inside of that organization called dot GitHub. And this is where we stash uh, various things that we want to apply to the entire organization. So in there, I have a directory called workflow templates. And here I've got the actual uh, properties file that defines that uh, template workflow that's going to show up here. So if I click on this, this is the actual workflow file. And then these are the properties that define when this workflow is going to appear in my user interface. So I give it a pretty print name. 
a description that helps my team figure out if this is the workflow they want. Uh, I can select from a palette of options. And here, I can also provide filters. So if GitHub examines the code in a repo uh, and using its uh, uh, AI machine learning capabilities determines that that is a node or a JavaScript repo, then this template workflow will appear. But if not, then uh, it won't. And then you've got other patterns down here you can use to match as well. Uh, if there is a package.json in the commit that's been modified, then this uh, template will appear as well. So again, what does that mean? What do these templates do for you? What it means is if I go to the actions tab uh, and select uh, create a new workflow, these appear here. So over here on the right is GitHub's uh, default uh, published Node.js because again, it's detected that this is a Node repository, but here's where my template appears. So lots of tools for organization administrators to use uh, to make it easy for folks to get started and do the right thing with respect to CI CD using GitHub Actions. All right, so this is a good spot, James. Uh, any thoughts from your end or any contributions or questions from the channel? Thanks, Brian. No, uh, we're doing excellent here. Uh, we have some good involvement here. No direct questions from the channel, but y'all, if you have anything to add, please feel free to ask. That's why we're here. And yes, this is the official um, GitHub channel. So <laughs> we're presenting to you live and with Mr. Brian Cross, our principal solutions engineer. Remote work is a thing. I am 300 miles from the nearest grocery store. That's right. All we're right. doing it live. <laughs> so let's go ahead and switch over and take a little more in-depth look at a slightly more complicated example. So earlier we talked about how GitHub Actions can respond to any one of the 100 plus events uh, that GitHub supports. Uh, and these events happen all the time. If you create an issue, delete an issue, modify an issue, comment on an issue, add a label to an issue, remove a label from an issue, or pull request, all of these are things <clears throat> uh, that uh, emit events that GitHub can use uh, to uh, start a workflow, for example. So this is a, uh, an example of a simple application. Now, in this case, we're using Java. Uh, here it is. And what it is basically is just a simple bookstore. So you're going to see something when it's uh, deployed uh, that's uh, pretty straightforward, just a list of books. So let's say, though, I want to change the title of one of my books. So I'm going to come in here. I've already created a pull request. We'll go ahead and click on that, and we'll see what I'm doing here click on the files changed tab. All I'm really doing is changing crossing the chasm to bridging the abyss. So a pretty simple check. Uh, now this pull request of course is open and currently it is, uh, I can't merge this pull request because it requires at least one approving review. But I still wanna know what my code is gonna look like when I deploy it somewhere. So how can I do that easily? Uh, and the way that I can do that easily in this case is to use the actions that my organization admin built into the template for this repo uh, and deploy it. And it's easy as you could possibly imagine. I'm gonna go ahead and click on labels and I want to deploy this to the staging environment. And that literally is all I have to do. When I add this label right here, that is going to create an event. And if I look at the actions tab, what I'll see are actions that have commenced to actually build and deploy this to my staging environment. Uh, and again, there's all kinds of stuff that's going in here. We are scanning the code with GitHub Advanced Security, uh, looking for defects that we've introduced into the code. We are building a container that we're gonna use to actually deploy that application. We are scanning that container, again, using GitHub Advanced Security to ensure that the container itself doesn't contain uh, 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 security vulnerabilities or defects. Then we're gonna package up that container and deliver it as a web app over to uh, Azure in this case. Uh, and what we're gonna get, let me just move my video window out of the way, uh, is a brand new version of our application. And there it is, bridging the abyss. So that deploy worked uh, perfectly. Now, if at any point in this process, uh, either the build or the test or the various security scans that are going on or the deployment itself, if any of those failed, uh, we can use that inside of the pull request to make it impossible uh, to merge that pull request. So what we're doing right now is looking at branch protection. Branch protection interacts uh, and integrates very closely with your software development workflow to allow you to set up guardrails to prevent individual developers from committing code they shouldn't commit, 
or inadvertently committing code to sensitive branches like main. Uh, my UI hasn't been updated yet, but the master branch is now the main branch. We want to encourage in GitHub the ability of anybody who wants to, to browse almost every repo in an enterprise and even to propose changes without relying on forks. Forking is a real problem inside the enterprise sometimes. So how do we do that though, without allowing uh, somebody who doesn't have a lot of experience uh, uh, or otherwise shouldn't be uh, committing code to our main branch and potentially affecting our um, applications in production. Uh, and the way that we do that is we set up these guardrails. So for any pull request to the main branch in this case, I've set it up to require at least one review, but you can require as many as six. And I've also set up that certain uh, also have to pass uh, before this pull request can be merged. So in this case, we're saying if the build on Ubuntu doesn't work, uh, fails for whatever reason, then this pull request will be unmergeable. Now, let's say, for example, though, we wanted to use GitHub Advanced Security's code scanning, which is detecting novel defects that we've introduced into our code. Let's say we wanted to use that in the same way. All we have to do is come into the branch protection section of the settings on the repo and click code QL. That's it. Now, if code QL detects anything in our uh, in our code, pull request won't be mergeable either. So you can use any integration. Doesn't have to be a GitHub action. It could be a Jenkins job. It could be an Azure DevOps pipelines job. Uh, could be anything that's designed to integrate with the GitHub pull request API. And that's literally almost everything. All right. So that's how we can use actions in conjunction with branch protection, uh, again, to provide guardrails around our software development lifecycle to encourage the widest possible audience uh, for participation and collaboration while still safeguarding our production applications. All right, so that's that. Looks like uh, the action that I actually kicked off did work. So let's go back over to the code section. Under the covers, what's happening here, there's a lot going on. Obviously, we are deploying to our environment, but we're also creating a GitHub environment uh, and GitHub deployments. So we can, uh, for example, uh, drill down into uh, those deployments to get information about what's going on there. And of course, view any of these environments. Now, cloud resources aren't free, of course. So I can tear down an environment just as easily uh, by clicking on the pull request and again, using what we call issue ops, uh, just apply a label. So in this case, I want to uh, go ahead and tear it down. Uh, I'm not seeing that label, uh, but uh, you can use issue ops the same way. And when we uh, when we do that, uh, an action is uh, workflow is going to run under the covers to actually deprovision uh, that cloud environment. Uh, and you can also create an action to run on a schedule to deprovision environments that developers have set up this way that haven't been interacted with over a time period that uh, that seems appropriate to you. So very easy to set up housekeeping to avoid uh, unnecessary or excessive resource consumption, but also super simple to set it up from the beginning for your developers to actually deploy their application directly to your cloud provider uh, without any knowledge necessarily of how to do that. So the next thing we're gonna do is drill down into how that actually works. So how do we set up an environment like this for your developers uh, to make it this easy? And All right, that's Mr. Cross, good yes, yes, sir. Hey, I think this is actually a great point before we get into that to see. We have some actually great reactions in chat. We're getting a lot of woes and seems good and lulls. And we actually have a question here from uh, TOC FCWS just asking, um, does this all come for free? So would you mind just at a high level, just going over kind of that value proposition of this being a bill for public repositories and some of our different paid plans? Yeah, so... Uh, I don't have the actual matrix in front sure. of me, but in a nutshell, uh, GitHub Actions are available for uh, GitHub Enterprise customers, for certain customers on team plans. Uh, and I'm not sure about availability for uh, straight up open source, but I believe they're available for there as well. Uh, if you have an organization, uh, for example, a GitHub Enterprise uh, organization that you're using at work, uh, you get 50,000 free action minutes a month, which is quite a bit. Uh, and then after that, it's a very, very uh, reasonable pay as you go uh, per minute charge. Uh, for what it's worth, GitHub is not making money uh, on the uh, uh, processor uh, runtime for our hosted runners. We are passing those costs through basically at our cost uh, in order to make actions as accessible as possible to everyone. Bear in mind that uh, the Linux runners are the cheapest 
Uh, next would be the Windows runners and the Mac OS runners are significantly more expensive. I think 20, 25% more expensive. <clears throat> GitHub package registry is also available. Uh, GitHub advanced security, the code scanning element that I talked about looking for defects in your code, novel defects, that is an additional product available uh, for purchase. The Dependabot alerts that I showed you, which are detecting vulnerabilities in the open source dependencies that you're pulling into your projects, uh, Dependabot is available to everyone. Uh, does that answer, answer the question, uh, do you think, James? Yes, sir, that does. Thanks so much, Brian. I include a link, everyone, in the chat at the bottom to our uh, pricing page as well. You can take a look. Free for our open source repos because we love open source and then different paid tiers, as Brian mentioned. Thank you, sir. Cool. All right. So how did I set up that environment? So we have this bookstore demo. Uh, James and I at uh, GitHub are SEs, so we do demos like this all the time. And, and, and one of the biggest... Uh, consumers of time and effort really is setting up uh, demo environments in a predictable state so that we can uh, efficiently uh, do a demo of GitHub features. Uh, and it turns out that uh, using GitHub Actions, GitHub Template Repositories, and the GitHub API, you can actually set this up so that folks like me uh, uh, and James can self-serve. We can create our own uh, environments uh, quickly and easily. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And the way I do it again is just by clicking on an issue. So I'm going to create a new issue. Uh, the organization administrator has created a template for me to use. I just have to move some things out of the way here so I can actually see that. I'm going to get started on that. <clears throat> and here it is. So all the instructions are in here for the template. What it boils down to is basically I just got to give my template a or my repository a name, which I'll do right here. And then I'm going to go ahead and submit this issue. Now, again, we talked earlier about this. GitHub supports over 100 events, one of which is creating an issue. Uh, under the covers, the template has automatically added the create demo uh, label. And if I head over to the actions tab in this repository, I can see that uh, under the covers, my environment is actually being created. Uh, now, this takes a little while, actually. Well, actually, it's already complete. So let's go ahead and take a, uh, uh, a look at that new environment. So I'm going to head up here, and we'll go ahead and just enter that URL. And our brand new uh, repository with all of that stuff should be set up here. And of course, now I've forgotten what I called it. So let's head back over to the issue and refresh my memory. What did I call it? And Brian, while we're looking around uh, for there, we have a question here from Derek Bell Rose. He asked, are these workflows available to look at? These specific ones, Derek, uh, probably not out there in our open source yet. However, these are probably a compilation of several different components from our actions marketplace um, that we're probably reusing and trying try to reduce that uh, consumption, if you will. Uh, Brian, any, any thoughts there? We don't have these on any open repos, do we? At this point in time we do not but honestly i can't think of a reason why they shouldn't be uh the mm -hmm. one the one thing that makes all of this magic happen of course is that we've got our uh we're deploying to azure in this case but it'll work exactly the same way for aws or google cloud or for that matter your internal cloud um <clears throat> the the key here that makes all of this work seamlessly are the secrets so our api keys uh passwords things like that are stored as organization secrets which i'll go into here in a bit but again, I don't see any reason why we couldn't make these public, uh, and we'll certainly work to, uh, to see what we can do uh, to make that happen here in the near future, because they are, I think, fantastic templates. So I think obviously you can see I've created a repo here. Uh, inside of this repo are all of those workflows that are gonna do what we talked about earlier, uh, deploying this uh, application to various environments, doing that code scanning, doing that container scanning, all of these are provided by that template repo. So uh, obviously, I think if you have a team in your enterprise that's responsible for uh, setting up pipelines, that's responsible for setting up environments, uh, architecture teams that are responsible for articulating best practices, how do we actually do our work in this organization, this is an incredibly powerful tool. So if somebody wants to create a new Java application or a new node module, for example, you can have all of this set up so they hit the ground running, their code is building, it's being scanned for defects, and they have an easy way to deploy this code minutes after they create their, uh, uh, their initial repository. So those are great as well. Another thing to think about is the GitHub Learning Lab. And what GitHub Learning Lab is, is an interactive tool that uh, anybody can use, but certainly enterprises can use, 
to set up uh, interactive uh, educational um, sessions. Users can work through uh, the steps in a uh, GitHub uh, Learning Lab lesson, but instead of interacting with a fake uh, video uh, or you know some kind of flash animation, they're actually interacting with actual uh, content in your GitHub organization and repos. Uh, if they do something right, they get positive feedback. If they do something wrong, they get uh, encouraging feedback to uh, guide them in the right path. The point of that is that you can set up multiple of these environments, leverage them for your production needs, but also leverage them along with GitHub Learning Lab uh, to help provide an asynchronous way to train up your entire development staff. So just something to think about there. All right, so we've gone ahead and created this environment. What else can we actually do with it? So we looked earlier at just the simple idea of adding a uh, an issue to a, uh, or rather a label to an issue or a label to a pull request and having that go ahead and um, <clears throat> launch uh, a uh, 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 deployment workflow. But in fact, you can also trigger actions and workflows to run when a repository is created. So I just created this, you watched it happen. Uh, and what's going on is that that initial deployment to our production environment in this case is already happening. So we've created the commits. Uh, we are scanning the uh, uh, container at this point, and then we're gonna go ahead and deploy to production. So obviously this takes a little bit of time to actually happen. Uh, so let's look at an actual workflow around how we might leverage these features in our actual day-to-day -day lives as real life developers. How are we doing on the channel out there, uh, James? Any reactions? Uh, I think we're doing great. I think uh, people are, are seeming to really enjoy the content. Y'all please keep the feedback coming in. And uh, Derek Bell Rose here, um, he actually has experience using some of these Terraform actions and he's actually quite curious about the use of labels for this self-service deployment and teardown. So if you can speak to that, maybe when going through the workflow file, sir, I think that'd be great information for everyone to understand how we're triggering them and, and really how that feeds into this uh, issue ops experience. Sure. Let me actually head back over to my other window so I can mess around with that uh, screwing up my flow. <clears throat> so really the key here is it doesn't matter what you want to do, whether you want to initiate a Terraform operation, uh, whether you want to have that Terraform operation create an environment, modify an environment, or break an environment down. The key really is uh, when do you want to trigger that? Um, obviously, you might want to trigger that uh, in response to a deployment to your main branch. Uh, but as we talked about here, sometimes you just want to do that in response to a developer request to see what things look like. Regardless of what you want to do, the key is really in the, uh, the way that these are actually triggered. So we're going to drill down into these workflows here. Uh, we're going to find a likely one. Uh, let's see, it's probably this one. And this one occurs on a push to any branch instead of the master branch. So not exactly the one that I'm looking for. Oh, where is it? Is it create deployment? Here we go. So <clears throat> earlier you saw that I added a label to that pull request and that made the magic happen. This is what actually causes that. The pull request category, under the pull request, there are about 25 different subtypes for that event. For example, open, closed, merged, modified, you name it. But in this case, if we add a label, this workflow will trigger. Uh, and this is all the goodness that makes that happen. So we've got the GitHub token that's provided by the workflow. Uh, and then later on, we've got tokens that uh, allow us to interact with our APIs uh, and that also allow us to uh, authenticate to and deploy code to the, uh, the Azure uh, environment. Again, this would work exactly the same way, whether it was Terraform, Google Cloud, Heroku, your own data center, doesn't matter. And by the way, Terraform has a fantastic library of uh, both workflow templates uh, and actions out there that make it super simple to just plug in a couple of variables using that secrets repository uh, and then make Terraform do stuff as well. So real quick while we're here, I thought I would talk about those, uh, those secrets. So you see them in action here, this GitHub token. This is actually provided by the GitHub runner environment when you run a workflow, but there's others down here as well. Uh, so for example, this OctoDemoBot to token. So if like me, uh, you have often run into the need to store sensitive information, passwords, keys, things like that, uh, in a way that's available to your CI or CD, CD workflows, uh, this can be dicey, right? So one way of doing that is the .env file, and if you forget to include that in your .gitignore, now all of your secrets are committed potentially to a public repository on GitHub. 
Uh, we will detect those uh, in many cases, but nonetheless, that's something you want to try to avoid. So why not just use the secrets repository inside of GitHub? And that occurs at two levels. The first, we're here in an individual repo. So let's click on the settings tab and uh, down here in settings uh, would be secrets. So I click on the secrets option in the menu uh, and then I can create a new secret. And it's the simplest thing in the world. It is just an encrypted key value store. So I can say I want to create a new secret, if I could spell correctly. That's the name that I'll reference in the code, and then I give it some value. And that's it. That's how we add a new secret. Now, these secrets are scoped to the repository. So if we head back over to the code section uh, and look at our actual workflow code, we can use these secrets only in the context of workflows that we're creating in this repository. But as we saw, there may be keys uh, and secrets that you want to make more widely available to your development teams securely, like this one, for example, or your cloud uh, deployment keys. And the way you do that is very similar, except you do it at the organization level. So I'm going to click on the Octo Demo Org. Let's see if I'm an actual admin here. Hey, I am. That's awesome. And again, exactly the same thing. So on the organization settings page, if you're an org admin, you also have a secrets repository. So that means you can set up things like your Azure API token and your AWS API token, uh, your Google Cloud API token. All of these can be here, totally secure, managed by organization admins, but available to be consumed by anybody who's working uh, in this organization. Does that answer the question? It's kind of a long answer. <laughs> yes or no, I think that was great going through that flow, Brian, of the workflow to how you call it, secrets and all those different things you can uh, label and put even conditionals in there. And uh, I'll let you get to your next portion and I'm just going to communicate to them our chat here. We had one of our user, Gawa Bugma Zero, saying that his company still unfortunately seems uses uh, Jenkins tier face. Uh, and just to that, uh, we did mention in chat, so we've had several really happy customers come from Jenkins or Silver CI or other solutions out there. Um, to get up actions with great results. And I think it's really that context switching that you no longer have to worry about. It's something that you're able to use out there in your open source projects and then also leverage at work in addition to this great body of a marketplace of different users. And then uh, one thing Brian Madhouse, Steve asked if we uh, aliased labeled with well, two L's to labeled with just one L, i.e. is it American English to international English? And I, and I, I believe that's correct because we like to uh, make the words fun in America when we can <laughs> compared to other English uh, speakers in the world. So funny little aside, but Hey, appreciate everyone in the chat and please keep the questions. Yeah, coming. Yeah. Uh, the UK and the United States, two great people separated by a common language. <laughs> That's All right. right. So let's look at a real life example of, uh, of an actual workflow. So I'm in here in my, uh, 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 my demo environment that I magically created in minutes using uh, simply by uh, creating an issue. Uh, and because this is a demo, it comes pre-populated with uh, an actual issue as asking for uh, uh, us to add a feature. So in this case, it looks like the user experience team uh, wants to add a rating feature to our bookstore application. Uh, and they've helpfully included UI screenshots and boy, I wish all issues were actually like this. Um, so of course, you know, moving forward, we can interact with this. Uh, we can talk uh, uh, about what we want to do. Uh, and really, that's the entire point of GitHub, right, is to bring the folks that are designing the product, the folks that are responsible for the, the economic viability of the product, the folks that are responsible for securing it, and most importantly, the folks that are responsible for documenting and creating it all together here in an issue to talk about this feature that we want to add. All right, so it looks like uh, we're going to go ahead and do this. So let's go over and take a look at the resulting pull request. And if I click on this and drill down, <clears throat> Uh, I'm going to see a pull request. Uh, we'll take a look at the file changes here in just a second, but it's pretty straightforward. Uh, unfortunately, this pull request uh, is uh, is broken, which means that uh, I can't merge it because in this instance, I did set up that branch protection. So because there is an error, uh, or rather a defect that GitHub Advanced Security Code Scanning through CodeQL actually found, can't merge this pull request. What's going on there? Let's go ahead and click on details and see what has happened. All right. So here's the code QL job, uh, and it looks like it has detected uh, a zip slip vulnerability. Well, that's super interesting. Let's, uh, let's drill down and figure out more about what's going on with that. And so to do that, I'm going to click on the security tab, and I can see that, in fact, my code in this case is absolutely riddled with bugs, potentially. So we've got uh, uh, 
uh, stuff that's returned from CodeQL. And also we've imported results from another tool. So it turns out that in the world of security alerts, there's a format called Serif, uh, Security Alert uh, Interchange Format, S-A-R-I-F. Any tool that supports Serif and many do, including GitHub Advanced Security, can be integrated here on your security view just by clicking on this button right here. Uh, so that means if you're using another tool or as many enterprises do, you wanna uh, use multiple tools uh, to ensure that your code is as secure as possible, we make that easy. So we talked earlier about how GitHub brings everyone together in the same place, using the same tools and the same workflow to work on your applications. The security tab that you're seeing here is GitHub's first step along a journey to do the same thing for the security community as well. So long story short, the security tab moving forward will be the home for DevSecOps, the same way that the rest of GitHub historically has been the home for Dev and Ops. Uh, so I've got my uh, vulnerabilities here. I can drill down into those and figure out what's going on. But nonetheless, even though my code is vulnerable, there's no reason that I can't uh, see what this looks like uh, in my environment. So I can go ahead and drill down into this and do the same thing that I did before. Uh, and uh, we'll run the same, uh, the same code. So let's deploy this to QA. I've added that label that will fire off that action. And hopefully that'll complete before we run out of time here. Uh, if not, uh, then I'll post a screenshot of it uh, later on when we finish up. Okay, so really honestly, uh, deploying this feature, uh, showing the power of issue ops and the fact that you can run GitHub workflows in response to just about anything that happens inside of GitHub was kind of the takeaway that we were hoping for here. Uh, bear in mind that uh, we focused really here on CI, CD, but you can use GitHub Hey, Brian. I think we actually lost your audio there, Brian. Ah, am I back? Yeah, you're back. You're back. No worries. <laughs> so just Weird. I must have. Going. Was I gone for long? Oh, no. Just about like 20 seconds or so. Oh, and actually, yeah. Gobble Boom uh, Zero just said, uh, Brian, 2020 to 2020. Uh, RIP cross symbol. So yeah, people, people were scared for a second. We were losing you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got eaten by a bear. All right. So what I was basically saying is we focused in this session on uh, CICD, right? Because that's a very important aspect of uh, automation in general, and certainly our efforts to automate the SDLC. But because GitHub Actions are a universal workflow automation platform, you can use them for just about anything you can think of, right? So in the past, uh, if we wanted to extend GitHub or automate GitHub or really do anything, uh, we had to set up a webhook. That webhook would send a payload to code that we wrote, uh, that we deploy, and that we have to maintain, uh, which would do whatever in response to that webhook and then interact with GitHub. Those days are over. 99% of the time, you can take all of your bot code, all of the things that you've written to interact with GitHub, and move them into a GitHub action. I'll show you an example here. So <clears throat> we have a customer who is using another platform and wants to switch over to GitHub, but they had this weird quirk in their workflow. Uh, and basically what they wanted to do was be able to automatically create a pull request whenever somebody created an issue. Uh, this particular legacy platform that they were using actually had a button in the UI to do that. Uh, GitHub doesn't have that and probably never will. So whether you think this particular workflow is a good idea or not, doesn't really matter. The bottom line is, if you have a workflow that you want to extend, you can probably use an action to do that. Let me show you what I mean here. So uh, here's an issue, BR test one, uh, and over here is the pull request that actually corresponds to that. If I click on that, first of all, it's a draft pull request, and it includes a link back to that issue uh, that actually started this uh, whole thing off. So if I want to do that again, I can just create a new issue. Again, use the template that my admins have set up. Uh, give it a branch name. Let's call it uh, branch hello. Which, whoa. And I just want to demo. And we're going to submit this issue. And under the covers, what's going to happen again, it's going to trap the fact that this issue was created. It's going to look at that label and see that we want to create a pull request and then it's going to do what it needs to do. So this has absolutely nothing really to do with code. What this has to do with is extending, enhancing, and changing the GitHub user experience 
uh, to accommodate whatever workflows uh, you might have. So this job is completed. We uh, passed the trigger section and we are now creating the pull request <coughs> inside of GitHub. So this will take a little bit longer to complete. I can of course check my status, uh, but at the end of the day, when I head back over to the pull request tab, it should be there. So there's my pull request. So again, whether you think this particular workflow is a good idea or not, opinions will vary. But if you have something in your workflow that you want to accommodate, that you've designed and that you're used to, but GitHub doesn't support it out of the box, you can use GitHub Actions uh, to replicate that workflow. So here we are. We didn't have to wait for GitHub to fix it, nor did we have to make changes to our SDLC uh, in order to enjoy the benefits of switching to GitHub. So it's uh, about 10 of, that's about all I have in terms of demo material that's uh, uh, ready to go. Uh, but of course, James and I are willing and able to answer any questions uh, or go along any path that you guys uh, would like to see. Yeah, great. Yeah, thanks so much for that, Brian. And uh, yeah, that was a great example of really extending out um, the GitHub platform in order to do whatever you need to with GitHub itself. So really a big benefit like that. Let's go through some of these questions you had in chat. I see we had one from uh, Dieter Nebi one What is the advantage of using GitHub Secrets over, for example, Azure Keybot or HashiCorp? So let me take a first stab at this. So uh, those actually have, as I noted, some great integrations in our marketplace. But the great thing about GitHub uh, Secrets is that, as Brian showed, you can scope those to just a repository to be consumed by your GitHub Actions, or you could scope those at an organization level and define which repositories have access to said secrets. And they're only accessible by GitHub Actions, your GitHub Action workflows. And that's a really great way to just moderate and delegate uh, responsibility into deploying to your test or QA or pre-prod or prod environments, right? And making sure that whoever has that has it at the right moment, the right time. And you can even take that to the organization level to manage it with even more granular detail there. So I'd say those are, I wouldn't even say the advantage, but just for this use case, it's really important, right? For your DevOps workflows, for your CI, CD. Uh, that's just kind of my take on it, Brian. You have anything to add there for uh, actions yeah. and, and secrets? Yeah, so uh, great points, James. And I think the fact that you can scope these to repos and organizations allows developers to be self-serve at the repo level, potentially, uh, and also allows organization admins to create secrets that are useful broadly across an entire organization. Now, having said that, uh, GitHub always has been, GitHub is today, and GitHub always will be, first and foremost, a platform. And what that means is that it is our intention and our goal to play nicely with the, the, the broadest possible array of tools. So if you're using Azure Key Vault, if you're using something from Hashi, if you're using anything, <clears throat> GitHub almost certainly will plug into that. Uh, and you can leverage that in your runner environments. Uh, we have no strong opinion about which secret solution is the best. Uh, in my experience, I generally find that uh, the best solution doesn't really exist, that there may be solutions that are better suited for one use case in one environment uh, and solutions that are better uh, suited uh, again in other uh, environments. So it's up to you which one you want to use. The advantage of GitHub Secrets, of course, is it's integrated. Don't have to switch to another tool. Don't have to call or email or try to get on someone's calendar to get my secret added to another system. Awesome. No, great for that. Thanks for that input. And hopefully that answers your question there in the chat. Uh, but if you have anything else to follow up, let us know. All right. We got a, a great explanation. Thanks from uh, Dieter and AB1. So no worries. Appreciate that question. We have one here from uh, Servrat Marici is, can we get access to that private repo that was shown in the demo? I took a note here that we'll check internally if that's something possible. As we know before, I think there's some great examples of just using these different components there. So I want we'll, we'll take that back, Brian, and see if that's something we could make uh, open in one more way or another. Sound good? Yeah, no, that sounds good. Uh, I'm all in favor of that. You know, we're all about transparency and openness here at GitHub. So we'll do our best on that. I love it. Awesome. And with that, Brian, I know we do have some time left. But there's no rush y'all as well. We actually want to keep riding this train a little bit longer. So Brian, how would you feel if uh, I take over the wheel for a little bit and show them another example of that kind of issue ops workload that we, we were speaking about? How does that work for you? I'm all for it. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and we'll watch the James show. All right, let's go. Give my friend Brian time to breathe a little bit. Hope everyone's doing very well. And uh, I'm going to share my screen. All right, I should be live. Okay, so everyone, Brian did a really great rundown of how easy it is to use actions, uh, things such as deploying the packages, uh, CI, CD, issue ops, integrations, stuff like that. So let's kind of stay on that trend just with a, another scenario to see really just the incredible flexibility we have with this uh, platform as a whole. 
So I have another uh, mock repository here that we use for demos all the time. And we've made some modifications to it and uh, to, to really streamline how we can show this feature to you. So I'm actually gonna go into my GitHub issues. Let's go in and create a new issue. And we have an issue template here called demo. And issue templates are a great, great way to uh, specify, oh, here's an issue for a bug and you have fields that users need to fill out or request for a feature like we saw Brian did earlier. So for this issue, I'm gonna go ahead and give it a name. So today's our demo for Twitch. Let's go ahead and update our source. I'm gonna put that in there. I'm gonna go ahead and submit this issue. And by doing that, we should actually see, all right, my GitHub action just triggered. So we go over here to the action. We can see it triggered. Let's see why that happened while it's running. So as Brian stated, there's literally over a hundred or so GitHub events that you can uh, monitor and react to via our webhooks and through GitHub actions, which really make it great to extend the platform in all these different ways. So what we're doing is we're looking at issues whenever a new one is opened, and then we're gonna continue through these different jobs and steps here. Uh, a lot of these are things we saw with Brian. So for example, here, we can do another parameter. If our issue event that triggered this, the title is demo, or has the title in there for reset this or clause we have, go ahead and continue with the following steps that we have. So these are just uh, additional steps here. We're doing a GitHub action for checkout. Actions is actually the GitHub repository that GitHub manages and we include a bunch of these kind of starter actions out of the box that we feel really valuable to our users, such as checking out your repository for usage in CICD. What I'm actually doing here is I'm actually uh, checking this out. I'm actually gonna make some modifications to my code itself in my repository. And then I'm gonna go ahead and update my issue uh, and create actually a branch right from the issue, kind of like we saw Brian do earlier. And we can see we're using our GitHub token. And then we're also using different pieces of information from the actual GitHub event that triggered this. For example, here, we're actually looking at the repository owner and their login, which is myself, looking at the name of the repo from where this occurred. So, so much useful information from our API that's uh, fed to you right from your GitHub Actions experience. All right, so if that worked to stall for our time, we can go over here and we see that our steps have completed. It went ahead and create a custom branch for us today. So I'm gonna go over to my issues, my demo for Twitch. And we also can use our, whenever we use our GitHub Actions to maybe create a pull request, or a new issue or a comment, it's gonna reference this GitHub Actions bot right here, uh, which can help power a lot of different experiences for users. So here we can see a new feature branch was created for Twitch. If I click that, I can verify that's true. Awesome. Let's go back one level. And from right here, actually, I'm just including links to, let's go ahead and create a new pull request from our branch. So I'm gonna click this button, and then we're gonna go ahead and create a pull request. And then from here, let's actually look at the different uh, files that were changed in this. So I didn't actually touch any code, if y'all recall that. All I did was create an issue. It created me a new branch and it actually ran a script that went ahead and went through and actually replaced some text in my uh, code base. So in my index HTML file, it's replacing the customer value with that value from our issue, which, which was Twitch. Okay, so let's go back here to our conversation tab. And we can see that nothing has been deployed yet. So how about I go here and use one of my labels as well. Let's go ahead and click deploy. Once we do that, we should see some activity occur. It's actually going to let us know, there we go. Like that, just from another label uh, assignment like Brian did earlier, we can see a GitHub action just triggered on this. So while this goes ahead and runs, we'll see some of the different pieces of functionality that we're touching here. So firstly, we have our PR deployment. So I'll show you this workflow file because we're using a couple of additional steps in here um, that give some really useful information to the experience. So for example, for this one, our on event trigger, we're using the pull request, as you can imagine, we're using the type called label. And down here, I'm actually doing something called a permission check. And just a simple uh, uh, job in this file that I defined and all it does Y'all, is it's just looking and seeing, hey, is the GitHub actor the person that actually ended up causing this event to happen? Is that actually the uh, owner of this repository? I always wanna make sure whoever is triggering this deployment to Azure is actually a uh, owner of the repo so we don't incur uh, any costs without knowing. And we go down here. Once the permission check works, it's gonna go ahead and just echo out this line into our uh, console, letting us know that it passed. Also have another step here called debug. This one's gonna skip because the if condition was not uh, 
actually met. As you can see here, the if condition, we're saying, hey, if the label debug occurs, go ahead and run this step, but it's not going to in our situation. And then after that, we're going to be running some of these different deployment steps here. So we can see we have a deployment step, we call it deployment via label. And basically with that label that we had just happened called deploy occurs, we're going to go ahead and run through some of our different steps here for our GitHub action. So you can see right from my script, we can actually use this GitHub action. It's called GitHub dash script. And this is great because um, I, I highly suggest you all look into this, especially if you're wanting to create some automation inside your GitHub processes, because you can use this to just run direct scripts inside this action, just feeding it the script parameter. And I can use, for example, some of our APIs to just easily create a new comment, for example, and just give it these following uh, components in it. So without even having to uh, write custom JavaScript or another file or uh, spin up a Docker container, for example, I can just do it all from an action, which is really, once again, the power of this platform. Another great thing is I actually had to need to get the branch name from which this pull request was coming. So I actually went out there and I was like, man, should I reinvent the wheel? Or should I see if another user has come up with this use case before? And I did. So shout out to the user MDE Coleman for this, for his PR branch name action, uh, because this actually will go ahead and output and grab the uh, uh, branch name from which this pull request is happening. And why did I want that? Because I'm actually going to create a deployment event inside GitHub and include that branch name value, because I actually need that step when I'm creating this deployment event, which I'm going to use to actually trace through the uh, SDLC process. So let's go back through to my pull request. And let's look at a few things that we have happening. So you can see we have this deployment section right here. Um, and apologies for not calling it earlier, but earlier it just said no deployments. And now you can see it's actually in a uh, in progress status. And that's a great part of this. This deployment, it's really a container for what exactly is going on with either your pull request or a commit. And you can relate that to deployments sense the name, which is going to help us know, okay, something is in progress. We can update it saying that that's occurring. If something fails, we can update it as well. If something passes, we can just relate a bunch of information that's really useful, especially if you think in the context of our CI CD, right? So some more jobs are running here. As you can see, we have several. Let's go take a look at them while this finishes spinning up. And actually I saw in the chat, Mr. Derek, no worries. Uh, great to have you here and I hope to see you in the future, all right? Make sure you follow us on uh, Twitter and our Twitch channel. Okay, so I go over here to my pull request. We can see that three minutes ago, right when I first applied that label, we also had a permission check occur and a deployment via that label itself. So let's actually go take a look at this workflow file because this one triggered off something specific. As you can see, once again, that on section is actually triggering on a deployment itself. So that previous step I, I did earlier, um, right from my label, that actually created a GitHub deployment. And now that deployment I can use to actually trigger off this following action here. Generally using actions to trigger actions is not something we do, simply from the mindset of you don't want to get in a circular sort of pattern. But since deployments are kind of extrapolate outside of the general workflow and they're very specific and related to a single SHA or commit, uh, whichever, uh, we can use them in this kind of scenario and still have that separation of the different workflows we're running. So our on deployment event, we're actually grabbing some issues from the deployment event that causes this to happen. Because once again, you can use your, your triggers in ways to actually bring information in there. So from that deployment event, I actually include a payload information, including the issue it came from, different references, IDs, et cetera, that I need to bring over. And here I'm actually adding some information for my Azure deployment uh, via my Azure subscription. So what web app name I want, what the resource group is and what location in Azure I want this deployed to. So we go down here, same steps before, we're doing our permission check because I just want to make sure. And then down here, we're going to be doing some of our deployment. We're going to update this issue, create some more comments in there just so we can see what's going on. And down here, I'm doing a bunch of different steps to basically build this .NET uh, MVC application. And then we're using actually a, a handful of actions uh, from Azure themselves, including this Azure login here, as well as just honestly, just running some different steps uh, inside the virtual machine in our runner that is occurring. Okay. I'm doing some more checks down here. I'm going ahead and logging out of Azure once I'm done. And I actually just include this step. I actually want to uh, make a ping out to that website and actually make sure that it's live and running before I go down here and update my deployment status. So another if condition we're doing, so we're doing if success, go ahead and uh, perform this update to that deployment status. Remember that we had, 
Um, otherwise, if it fails for whatever reason, this workflow breaks, go and update it as well because we want to know it failed and just set that status to failure, if y'all see there. Okay, so let's go back to our pull request. And hopefully, all right, we see that this branch was successfully deployed. I want to click here. I'm going to click view deployment. And there we go. You see our web app is updated. It's up in Azure. And we update our reading time to say it's reading time of Twitch. All right. And y'all with Oops. that, I think we are actually at time and at close. We're happy to stay on for any more questions. I see one here from Kieran Ray of Sun. How do we deploy different environments based on Azure region? Um, there's probably a handful of different ways you can use it. In our example, we saw just quickly back to this file down here, you can see, I specified my Azure location and this is just a variable inside here. And then later on in the script, I'm going to reference that Azure location when I'm doing one of my published jobs, I believe is how that's occurring. Yep. Right here. I'm saying, Hey, go ahead and create a new Azure group. What's that resource group name? And then what's that Azure location we want to spin it up. And so if I think it's also worth pointing out that uh, uh, for things like uh, uh, variables, basically, oh, <clears throat> when you trigger an event, a workflow, whether it's from a code commit or a uh, adding a label or anything else, the workflow engine will receive a huge volume of information. Uh, and included in that information could be, for example, a list of regions that you want to deploy to. Uh, the same way that we saw earlier when we created that demo environment uh, by filling out a little JSON in an issue, you can use exactly that same pattern uh, to select any or all of the regions that you want to deploy to as well, and then pass that into the workflow that way. Exactly. Great point there, Mr. Brian. All right, friends. Uh, it's been a solid hour with everyone here. Appreciate uh, all the feedback and comments in there and educating our friends more about GitHub Actions, uh, especially in regards to GitHub Enterprise and different capabilities there are. Um, if there's no other questions in chat, I think we are going to go ahead and wrap up for today. But please follow us on Twitch, on Twitter, our different social medias, and we'll see you all in the next one.